I just wanted to show you this quick and really nifty technique which originates in games development to plan paths for AI agents, for example in tower defense games. It's a computationally easy algorithm and also a really neat setup if you want to start learning VEX because this can be built using only three to four lines of really simple VEX code. I want to start out with a grid, so let's drop that down and dive in there. The size of it doesn't really matter, but we need a bit of more rows and columns. So let's say make a grid 100 by 100 rows and columns. So we've got a bit of subdivision here. Next, I want to create two groups on that grid. One for the target, so the goal for our agents or our particles to move towards to, and one for the areas to exclude, which are the areas where we're going to set up colliders. Let's use the groups up for that. Set it to points, and we want to name this first group goal, for the goal where our particles should move to. And let's just use a bounding region with a small box to set our particles goal, maybe up here, somewhere there. So yeah, we've got 12 points as our goal. Next, let's drop down another group. Again, setting this to points, calling this exclude for areas where the particles are not allowed to go. And also let's use a bounding region, in this case, maybe a bounding object, so I can pipe in objects in here. Let's do that, dropping down a merge first, so I can merge in multiple objects here, create multiple colliders, and maybe use a box, shell wire in here, and select that group node so we can see the selection is working here. I'm gonna move that box maybe a bit to the side like this, and maybe scale it up a bit, like so. And also let's drop down a tube, could also use a sphere that doesn't really matter. Just set it to polygon and add end caps, and maybe a few more divisions, so its appearance is a bit more round. Wire that in here, and maybe move its center a bit to the side, and a bit up here on the z-axis, and also increase its radius a bit, like so. So we end up with these areas where the particles should not go. How do we use our grid to generate those directions? Well, we're going to use a mathematical tool called the gradient, which has been implemented into Houdini's measurement SOP in Houdini 17 or 17.5, I think. And the gradient generates a vector pointing in the direction of a value's steepest ascent. Let me show you what I mean. First, we need to create a value. So we want a high value on our goal points here. Let's create one using the attribute create, and that doesn't go into the tube, but should go down here on our grid. And we're going to create an attribute, let's call it heat. And let's only create this on the goal points and set its default value maybe to 100,000. So a rather high value. Let's visualize this. Visualize the heat attribute. So yeah, it's only high here. So let's remap it, ramp it, maybe select the infrared range here. And the ramp range is currently set to auto. So the visualize node tries to do its best to remap our values, which now should range from zero to 100,000 in the zero to one range. Let's keep that in mind for later. All right, we only have values up here, really high values, and we don't have values down here. Let's take care of that by blurring out this whole thing. Let's blur the heat. And let's blur it for maybe 1280 iterations, which should go decently fast as this runs on the GPU, OpenCL. And let's visualize it again. And we can see now we've got this ramp here going out there of those values fading. And now I want to set my ramp range here, not to auto, but to min and max. And just want to dec decrease this minimum factor here to see and check if we've got values all to the way down here, which we do, which is important. Because next what we generate is a gradient. So we're going to compare values at each point with the values of the surrounding points and generate a vector, that means a direction, pointing in the direction of each surrounding point where the heat value increases most. Sounds a bit complicated. Let's just do it using the measure SOP. Wire that below the attribute blur here, highlight it. And we want to measure points and we want to measure the gradient of an attribute, namely of the heat. We can see when we zoom in here, we are now getting those vectors, those arrows pointing towards our goal here. However, there are also arrows in the areas that we want to omit, so the excluded areas. And that is because we didn't set them up yet. Let's do that in the attribute blur. And we want to blur this heat attribute only in the areas that are not my goal and not my exclusion zone. So let's select the exclude and the goal group, and let's just exclude them with an exclamation mark in front of them. So that means do not blur in the exclude group and do not blur in the goal group, which when I visualize my attribute blur later, you can see results in this here. So these areas have been omitted here. 
And when I highlight my gradient here, you can again see that these areas have been emitted and quite contrary, the vectors, the gradient vectors point away from these areas. So any points close to here, try to get away from these areas into this zone here, where they move towards the target. So, so far that is generating our flow field. Let's use that to advect some points. And first what I want to do is scatter some points in here, maybe in this area here, so that we have a decent start area. For that, let's just create another grid and I'll just scale it down here into this area and then scatter a few points on it. Maybe, let's say, 400 points. I'll just move this over here and now we're going to write four lines of vex. And I'll try to make this nice and easy using a point wrangle because I want to move those scattered points here. I want to move those using the values of this gradient here. So in the first slot go the points, second slot goes our grid with the gradient values. The first thing I want to do here is for each point, I want to look up the nearest point on the grid. For that, we're going to use a function called near point, and that will return the point number of the point on that grid that's near to a point here. So that's going to be an integer. Let's call it NPT for near point equals to the result of the function we're calling, which is called near point. And near point needs two parameters. Again, if you need documentation for a function, just make sure your cursor is in the function name here and hit F1. So this is a near point function documentation here. And we can see we need two parameters here. One, the geometry on which we want to find the nearest point, which is this slot here, the slot with the ID one, and then the position vector to which we want to find the closest point. So again, geometry coming in through slot with the ID one, that's the second slot here. And then our position vector, that is just V at P, Houdini's built in position for the point we're currently working on. So this is gonna look up the nearest point on this grid here. Next, let's read out the gradient value here and the measure when we middle mouse on it, we can see it generated a vector called gradient. So we wanna look this up. Let's call this one vector gradient equals two, and we're gonna use the point function to look up the value of the gradient on that point we just found here. Again, this needs the input slot one, then the name of the attribute we wanna look up on that point here, and it's called gradient, so gradient, and then the point number. That's the one we looked up up here called NPT. So now we write in the gradient. What we can see here color coded is the magnitude of the gradient. So arrows that are red are longer than arrows that are blue. However, in my case, I want my points not to move faster up here where the magnitude of the arrow is greater. I just want my points to constantly move towards that target. So what I have to do down here is normalize my gradient vector here. That means scaling it to a length of one. Let's do that. Gradient equals to the normalized version of my gradient. So now we scale it to one. And finally, let's move our points by just updating their position. So V at P points position equals to V at P plus. This is the shorthand for this, the value of our gradient times a step length. And in this case, I want to dial this in with a slider. So let's create a float slider and call it step length. And click here to create the slider and dial in a value of say 0 0.05. So you can see those points moved a tiny bit now. When I go to scatter points here, you can see they moved a tiny bit in that direction. Let's save this and now let's animate those. So what I want to do is execute this code here, these four lines over and over again for each frame. Uh, when I hit play now, nothing happens because this only executes once and then keeps its position there. Also, I might want to switch on real time here. So again, not much to see. However, I can just throw this into a solver, a SOP solver, which very similar to this point wrangle here, takes in the points in the first slot and the gradient on the second. And then I'm just going to copy my point wrangle, dive into the solver here, paste it and really sloppily wire in the first slot to my previous frame and the second slot to input two. Go up one level, highlight my solver and hit play. And I can now see my points swarming towards this target point while avoiding my collision geometry. Let's just highlight the collision geometry, goes to that in here. And we can see they are broadly avoiding this geometry here. So I can get rid of that. And the last thing I might wanna do is on my solver here, go to this cogwheel symbol here, go to edit parameter interface, which brings up this window here and dive into the solver and in the point wrangle, I just wanna drag out my step length parameter up here, hit apply and accept and go up one level. And now I've got this step length parameter on my solver here where I can dial in the speed of my points. All right, let's have a look at the gradient again. That is a really handy tool in mathematics and computer graphics especially because the gradient can determine the direction in which a certain value, a certain parameter 
increases the most. So it can be used to generate directions from a single value. And there are quite a few algorithms that make use of this technique. For example, one way of finding normals in a signed distance field, that means a volume that represents some geometry, would be to take its gradient to generate quote-unquote normal vectors for that volume. But in this case, we used it to just really quickly generate a rather coarse, but still working vector field that tells our particles, our agents, where to go and which areas to avoid while doing so. All right, quick setup, but a fun one. Hope you're enjoying this as much as I do. And I'm really intrigued to see for which effects you guys are going to use this. So as always, please share your results. Last, not least, I want to thank all of you guys supporting us on Patreon. Without your support, we would simply not be able to do what we're doing here. So thanks so much for supporting us and the stuff we do. And a special thank you goes out to Francois Bayargent, Netherrealm Studios, Encore VFX, Important Looking Pirates, Joseph Howerton, Nick Nick, Chris Hebert, and Rafika Nadol. Thanks so much, guys. And until next time, it's cheers and goodbye.